on behalf of the Indira Gandhi National Open University, I welcome all of you to the first Professor G. Ram Reddy Memorial Lecture organized jointly by IGNU and the Commonwealth of Learning. Professor Ram Reddy, the first Vice Chancellor of IGNU, was a person of eminence in the area of distance education, known nationally and internationally. More than a decade ago, when the concept of a national open university was being debated in the parliament, the then Honorable Minister Shri K. C. Pant summed up Professor Reddy's contribution to the cause of open learning. He said, and I quote, If I may say so, there is nobody else in the country who has his experience in this particular field. Therefore, all of us, I think, should feel quite safe in entrusting the beginning of this university to him. Unquote. Professor Ram Reddy himself was concerned about quite a few issues in the open learning system. One of them was regarding maintenance of standards. He said, and I quote, If you don't maintain quality in conventional system, it is not visible. But if you do not produce high quality programs here, you will be immediately exposed. There has to be a regular evaluation of the course materials. Unquote. He was also concerned regarding duplication in course materials. He said, and I quote, the second channel challenge before us is how to avoid duplication of the course materials and the programs. There has to be some sort of networking of courses offered by the various distance education universities and departments. Professor Reddy was also concerned about integrating the conventional and the open learning systems. He said, and I quote once again, the one challenge we have to face is how institutions like IGNU, the Distance Education Council and the UGC can come together and attend to this aspect. The ceremonies will now begin and they begin with Professor Dhanarajan, President of the Commonwealth of Learning, lighting the lamp. Join the Commonwealth as its president. The lamp has been lit, and Professor Dhanarajan will now garland the portrait of Professor Ram Reddy. He is accompanied by Professor Patwale, present Vice Chancellor of the Indira Gandhi National Open University. Professor Takwale, the Vice Chancellor of IGNU, will now welcome the gathering and pay his tributes to Professor Ram Reddy. Professor Takwale. Dr. Gajraj Dhanarajan, Srimati Pramila Ji Reddy, Vice Chancellors of neighboring countries and state open universities, Pro Vice Chancellors, faculty, staff, and students of IGNU and the other state open universities, distinguished guests, and ladies and gentlemen. On 2nd July, exactly a year back, we all heard the shocking from Reddy in London. Many of us could not believe it. As some of us a couple of days earlier at Birmingham, enjoying his cheerful and enlightened company. In the 17th International Conference held in UK, he was crowned along with Sir John Daniel with an honor of excellence in distance education, the highest international award 
in recognition of his distinguished services for the development and dissemination of distance education. A year has passed and now on the occasion of the first death anniversary of Professor Ram Reddy, I stand before you to welcome you and I welcome all those who are assembled here and elsewhere in the receiving end rooms of teleconferencing network to this first Professor Ram Reddy Memorial Lecture instituted jointly by Commonwealth of Learning and Indira Gandhi National Open University. It is a privilege as well as pleasure for me to welcome in particular Professor Jee Dhanarajan, today's speaker and president of the call, Srimati Pramila Reddy, wife of late Professor Ram Reddy, Professor Samsher Ali, Vice Chancellor of Bangladesh Open University, Professor Arthan Aike, Vice Chancellor of Sri Lanka Open University, Dr. R. V. R. Chandra Shekhar Rao, Director Asian Programs, Commonwealth of Learning, and all the distinguished Vice Chancellors of four state open universities from Andhra Pradesh, Rajasthan, Maharashtra, and Bihar. All of us know Professor Ram Reddy was the most distinguished personality in many ways. Born in 1929, in a family of a farmer from Karimganj district of Andhra Pradesh, Professor Ram Reddy was the first matriculate from his village and had to earn his education through hard work and self-help. Professor Reddy was a product of the aspiration of the rural youth of 60s, inspired by the newly obtained Indian independence and supported by democratic and developmental atmosphere. In his pursuit of education and knowledge, he was always committed to the common people where he came from. This is amply revealed by the teams he assembled in his task of institution building and his choice of Panchayat Raj as a topic for his PhD research, which has now become a major program for achieving ultimate form of democracy of the people. It is no wonder, therefore, Professor Reddy jumped at the idea of open and distance education as an instrument for empowering people through knowledge and education. After having a successful and enlightened academic career, both as a university teacher and vice chancellor of Osmania University, he has, for the rest of his life, closely associated with distance and open education. His successful leadership as the founder of vice chancellor of both Andhra Pradesh Open University, now called Dr. B. R. Ambedkar Open University, and Indira Gandhi National Open University, vice president of Commonwealth of Learning, chairman of University Grants Commission, is well known to all associated with higher education. In fact, many gathered here, we are fortunate in having opportunities to work with Professor Ram Reddy and have, I'm sure, those memories of Professor Reddy as an unforgettable treasure of their personal and institutional life. Sir John Daniel, Vice Chancellor of the UK Open University, assessed the achievements of Professor Ram Reddy in the following words, and I quote, to have been Vice Chancellor of three universities and Chairman of a University Grants Commission is a record achievement in higher education without parallel in the world. No one has done more to bring open education into a place of prominence in the educational system, not only in India, but also in the whole world." Unquote. Professor Ram Reddy's real contribution is in successfully convincing policymakers in India about the need for open university system communicating the vision of democratization of education and building the model of open university which is appropriate to the Indian situation. He was a leader of men, always inspiring and supporting his colleagues to achieve the institutional goals. We in IGNU feel greatly indebted to his leadership and services he rendered in establishing and laying sound foundation of this university. We therefore decided to perpetuate his memory by an established Professor Ram Reddy Memorial Committee under the chairmanship of our senior colleague, Professor Rakesh Khurana, Pro Vice Chancellor of IGNU. The Board of Management of IGNU has already accepted the measures recommended by the committee, some of which are to name the library of IGNU after Professor Ram Reddy, institute fellowships, prizes, and award for excellence in distance education, research work, innovations in improving open university system, etc., and 
generate endowment funds to support fellowships in various activities in memory of Professor Ram Reddy. Another important measure was the proposal we made to the Commonwealth of Learning for organizing an international lecture at IGNO by an internationally known educationist from a developing country in Asia. We are grateful to Cole for accepting our proposal immediately and offering 6,000 Canadian dollars yearly to organize such a lecture in memory of Professor Ram Reddy. Our first choice of the speaker was obviously Professor G. Nandarajan, not only because he is the president of Cole, but because of his expertise, dedication, and achievements in developing a new and innovative distance education systems in South and Southeast Asia. Dr. Dhanrajan holds degrees from the universities of Madras, London, and Aston in Birmingham. Dr. Dhanrajan is a scientist, biologist of great reputation and a citizen of Malaysia. He has held very important positions in Open Learning Institute of Hong Kong and University Science Malaysia. He is also honored and awarded by universities from Canada, UK, Malaysia, and USA. He is today the most appropriate expert in the world to deliver the memorial lecture. Dr. Dhanrajan was acquainted intimately with Professor Ram Reddy, and as a president of Commonwealth of Learning, he is now shaping the destiny of open university education at the international level. His leadership of Cole is a great pride and value to all of us, particularly when radical changes are taking place all over the world in the field of open education. We are grateful to Professor Dhanrajan for accepting our invitation and being with us after undertaking quite a long journey uh, to give the first memorial lecture. On the eve of the retirement of Professor Ram Reddy, from the chairmanship of UGC on 4th December 1994, we, the IGNO, State Open Universities, and National Open School, organized a national seminar on the theme of open learning, a rededication to innovation, at Delhi during 3rd and 4th December 1994. We felicitated Professor Ram Reddy at the seminar. The seminar was supposed, supported by many leading institutions and attended by eminent scholars and educationists like Professor James Maraj, Professor Kulandai Swami, Professor Tony Dot, and others. The papers presented reveal the current status of open education in India and the plans and programs for its future development. Little we could imagine that the proceedings of the seminar will be released on the occasion of the first death anniversary of Professor Ram Reddy. A book so ably edited by Dr. S. K. Gandhi, Dr. Rudra Datta, and Srimati Sushmita Mitra, entitled Open Learning System in India, is published by IGNO. It contains the proceedings of the seminar, speeches at the felicitation function, and a profile of Professor Ram Reddy. The book will be released today at the auspicious hands of Professor Dhanrajan. When great changes are taking place in India and elsewhere, we feel deeply the absence of wise counsel and friendly advice of Professor Ram Reddy. As a mark of our commitment to the transformation going on in the distance education, we thought it proper to have his memorial lecture through IGNU teleconferencing network, reaching this time to 19 receiving end rooms at 16 regional centers and three state open universities. The communication technology in this form, besides demonstrating the things that are coming up in distance education also points to the direction of paradigm shift in the offing. This international memorial lecture is being nationally telecast with usual interactivity. The viewers of the function today can send their queries and comments to us here over telephone or fax, and some of them will be answered by Dr. Dhanrajan. On behalf of myself, faculty, and staff of IGNO, let me pay our humble tribute and deep respect to the memory of Professor Ram Reddy and rededicate ourselves institutionally and individually to the commitment of realization of democratization of education and empowerment of the people through open education system, which is the ultimate goal of open education so dear to Professor Ram Reddy. Let me welcome you all again to the first Ram Reddy Memorial Lecture. Thank you. Professor Dhanarajan will now release the book dedicated to Professor Ram Reddy. 
as Professor Takwale expressed. This book is a result of a seminar that was organized on the occasion of Professor Ramredi demitting his office as the chairperson of UGC. The book has been edited by Dr. S.K. Gande, Professor Rudar Dutt and Dr. Shushmita Mitra. Rajan will now present copies of the book to Mrs. G. Premila Ramreddy, wife of Professor G. Ramreddy. <laughs> Dr. S. K. Gandhi, Pro Vice Chancellor Ignu and editor of the book. <laughs> Professor Rudar Dutt, ex principal, School of Correspondence Courses and Continuing Education, University of Delhi. Dr. Shushmita Mitra, Project Fellow, Human Resources Development of the National Open School. Professor Takwale, Present Vice Chancellor of IGNU. And Professor Rakesh Kurana, Pro Vice Chancellor, IGNU. And now, the first memorial lecture. Professor Dhanarajan, President, Commonwealth of Learning, please. Vice Chancellor, the Indra Gandhi National Open University, Mrs. Ram Reddy, distinguished guests, colleagues here in the headquarters of Indra Gandhi National Open University and everywhere else in India and friends. I consider it a, a singular honor and a great privilege to be here this afternoon to remember and pay tribute to a caring leader, a great teacher, a wonderful friend, a faithful husband, and a loving father. Professor Gadam Ram Reddy was all of these things and more. Professor Reddy was a virtuous man, a man of high morals and great humility. He loved India with a passion, was immensely proud of this country and its many achievements. He was rightly proud of this university. He is no longer with us but he continues to be with us. I did not know Professor Ram Reddy as well as many of you listening to this lecture. That is my personal loss. But during the little time that I knew him, he taught me many things. And one that I treasure and remember is a story of Raibia and his two sons, Paravasu and Arvavasu. I will not repeat this story this evening, but those who know it from the Mahabharata will recollect the sad end to Raibia's life in the hands of Paravasu. The message that Ram Reddy left for me through this story is the difference between education for knowledge and education for life or virtue. Learning is one thing, but learning for life another. Through learning, one should know the difference between good and evil. And unless learning itself goes deeper and beyond the accumulation of information, knowledge will not become a virtue. In the years that I knew Professor Reddy, one subject that was the main feature of our conversation every time we met was education and its many challenges in the coming decades for the world, generally, 
but more so India particularly. Though he was full of praise for the achievements in education of this country, he also feared that the nation was not confronting the magnitude of the educational challenge aggressively. He was concerned not only with numbers, but also with the value of education to manage our day-to-day -day lives. Ram Reddy feared that in general, not enough was being done to bring education to all, and that those who practice education were perhaps not paying sufficient attention to issues such as quality and relevance. Those who were using education were not seriously appreciating the value of the service that was being provided, nor its purpose. And those who were managing education were not tracking society close enough to respond to its needs efficiently and cost effectively. Perhaps these worries may have been the catalyst that encouraged him to move in the direction of distance education and open learning. He saw in this innovation an opportunity to address many of his anxieties, especially those that had to do with quality, relevance, speed, and efficiency. Tonight, in this lecture, call face to face with distance education, commemorating his memory. I wish to visit some of these issues in the context of the coming millennium and the role of distance education within it. Most of us, or dare I say, all of us in this hall and out there in the country tonight are children of the 20th century. We inherited a planet from our forefathers which had at most one billion people, individuals, less than a dozen cities with more than one million inhabitants, and a priceless fortune in renewable resources, millions of species of organisms, both animals and plants, great deposits of fossil fuel, as well as groundwater and other useful minerals such as copper, tin, mercury, zinc, plenty of fresh water, clean air, favorable climate, and an intact ozone layer and fertile soil. With a resource using species such as the Homo sapiens, conflicts were not avoidable, but they were mostly local and generally confinable. As we stand at the threshold of the 21st century, we could, our generation could ask ourselves, what would be the legacy of our century to our children and our grandchildren? We could simply ask, for instance, whether we have left the world a better place for them to live rather than the one we inherited, or we could either individually or collectively review humankind's performance during the last 95 years and make some judgments. Whether we make judgments ourselves or not, future historians certainly will have a feast assessing us. Our century has witnessed some truly remarkable and great events. There is, of course, the end of colonialism, the achievements in science and technology, a freer flow of information, a few uncertain steps towards universal rule of law, a greater access to education and health for most, and an acceptance of the principles of equality for all human beings. These achievements, remarkable as they are, have also run in parallel to some terribly shameful things we have done as human beings. In practice, many of our fellow human beings are still denied equal access to justice, to decent living, and an equal share of the planet's wealth. We have, as we've progressed industrially, hurt our environment, in some cases irreparably. Violence and barbaric military practices are still widespread, and institutionalized terrorism is with us in its many forms. Given that we have no more than five years remaining in this century, it is unlikely that our generation will have the capacity or the political will to solve many of the problems we have created for ourselves. The problems we will leave behind may appear local in context, but they are global in impact. Let me reflect with a few examples. In early 1980, an airline attendant named Gitan Dugas died in the city of Vancouver, where I now live. 
He died of kidney complications brought about by years of infection that itself was brought on by a failing immune system. Gitan is a celebrity of sorts. His immune systems failed because of a virus. That virus is notoriously known as HIV, and it causes AIDS. Since then, this unknown disease has infected some 8 to 10 million people globally. Its presence has been reported in at least 140 countries. Although not discovered until 1981, the virus itself has been circulating in the human environment for centuries, dormant in small pocket. We are still not certain what prompted its emergence in the 80s, but its spread reflects the conditions modern human beings create, created for its rapid transmission. Rural urban migration, air transport, trade in blood products, liberal sexual behavior, and methods of substance abuse have all made a contribution on an otherwise local and slow-moving virus into a global and fast one. The AIDS virus is, no, is by no means the first the, nor the last of such health threats of this century. The traveling influence of virus of the Chinese population centers, the familiar and re-emerging scourge of malaria, dengue, yellow fever, the ugly Ebola, are but a few examples of the enormous virus power that our environment harbors and then becomes infected, which by and large seems to be the consequence of human behavior and lifestyle. From about the mid 80s, the human race has continued to add about 100 million or more people to its population every year. The planet now carries 5.5 billion people. And by the turn of the century, this will be roughly 6.2 billion. Most of the growth is taking pl place in our part of the world. The growth of populations, as we all know, has global implications, not only in terms of numbers, but also in the ways these unfold. For example, our poor will grow at a much faster rate than our rich. This imbalance is dangerous. If one looks at the armed conflicts of recent years, most of them seem to have poverty as a common denominator, Cambodia, Afghanistan, East Timor, Sri Lanka. Not only do populations grow, but the age structure of these populations will also alter. This alters dependency ratios. The richer parts of the world are aging, and therefore a larger part of the population will be out of productive work. While the poorer parts of the world are young and at school, therefore necessitating greater investments in education and other services. Larger populations lead to another problem migration of people from rural to urban areas. It is estimated by the year 2020, some 3.6 billion people will be living in megacities. And most of the cities will be now in the now poorer parts of the world. Municipal governments will be challenged far beyond their capacities to provide transport, waste disposal, crime prevention, health, education, nutrition, name it. Larger populations also lead to a lot of pressure on the natural environment. Two years ago, the Mexican peso plummeted, and along with it, the Mexican equities market. I was living in Hong Kong at the time and saw the Hang Seng Index dive the following day. That evening, the local television station carried graphic stories of two Hong Kong punters jumping off the 40th floor of two Hong Kong high-rise buildings. Their fortunes were wiped out. In this increasingly interdependent world of ours, there is no crisis that is local. This includes the debt crisis of the third world. In 1993, external debt of developing countries amounted to some 1.8 trillion US dollars, and their debt services amounted to 22% of their export earnings. In total, these countries up were paying up to $150 billion in uh, servicing the debt against which they were receiving between 90 and 100 billion in loans and aid. The interest rate goes back to the north. Well, one would think there should not be any adverse impact on the debt collectors. Think again. A recent study by the North-South Institute of Canada indicated that because of cutbacks on imports, including food imports as a consequence of the debt burden, it cost Canada, the country where I now live, 130,000 jobs and US 24 billion in earnings over a seven year period. 
Canadian banks are owed 24 billion by third world countries. The last on my list of dilemmas that humanity is confronted with or the sad inheritance we will leave behind is the state of the environment. Putting aside the north-south debate on the subject, the facts are global warming, warming is increasing and it's a fact of life. The ozone layer is breached and the hole is getting bigger. Our bio biodiversity is depleting and we are losing precious species, especially plant species. The state of our air and water, you know it better as you drive through New Delhi or Old Delhi. Like me, you too may come to the conclusion that we are not living an enviable inheritance to our children and their children. Through our science and technology, trade and travel, communication and confrontation, the damage we have done to our health, wealth, environment is not confined to the immediate communities we live in. Local concerns have been transformed into global ones, local problems into global ones. This increased global interdependency of nations on their cultural, political, and economic activities has made it even more important at this tail end of the century that individuals of all nations have to be empowered with the knowledge and skill to bring about a transformation to their environment and living condition. Throughout the ages, education has been the most powerful agent of change. You've heard Ram Reddy say it too often, and often again said it should be. Since discovering education, those human beings who have received it seem to have benefited mostly from the experience, whether it be for personal or social development. At times, some people may have seen education as the root cause of all our ills, but even they will not begrudge the fact that the acquisition of knowledge has enabled individuals to gain a more profound understanding of human development and building relationships among individuals, communities, and nations. It is fashionable in some quarters to be extremely critical of education, especially for economic and financial reasons, equally. Thank God there are enough people around the world who see human development as the core of any development process that even in times of economic adjustments and austerity, some services such as education, the empowerment of individuals through the provision of learning, a basic human right and a social responsibility must be protected. It is this desire to empower individuals that led to those who gathered for the Education for All conference in Jamtian in 1990 to declare among other things that every person, child, youth, and adult, shall be able to benefit from educational opportunities designed to meet their basic learning needs. To travel from where we are today in education and educational provision to where we should be by the next decade will demand a lot of commitment from every part of humanity. The task of providing an education to all throughout their lives will not only be a challenge to our intellectual and physical resources, it will also be a challenge to our technological capabilities and pedagogical skills. Look at the task ahead. At the start of the last decade of the present millennium, globally more than 960 million adults were Ill are illiterate. Two-thirds of them are women and girls. More than 100 million children, mostly girls, currently do not have access to primary schooling the number is growing. More than 100 million children and countless millions of adults fail to complete their basic education programs. Millions more sa satisfy school attendance requirements but do not acquire essential knowledge and skills. More than a third of the world's adult population have no access to printed knowledge, new skills and technologies that could improve the quality of their lives and help them to shape social and cultural changes. What should be obvious from these statistics perhaps is the level of investment that will be required to bring education at the basic level for at least one-fifth of humanity, beyond basic level for another fifth, and lifelong learning opportunities for a third fifth. Just to keep up with the basic needs alone will require more resources in the next 10 years than all that has been done in the last 10. 
not only have we to cope with the resource need, we also need to present education to those who need it in a meaningful and user-friendly ways. This is a challenge for the academic community. Education in one form or another will have to be presented to a whole range of new clients, including those who are functionally illiterate. Apart from the 900 million illiterates, there are mostly half as many adults who cannot cope with the demands of daily life on the basis of their literacy level, whether it is reading a health label or instructions on operating a VCR. The physically challenged. Annually in Asia alone, 15 million people become disabled as a result of war, diseases, accidents, and malnutrition. Their major hope for self-improvement will have to be the education that has to reach them. The long-term unemployed. Long-term unemployment is a pathology. Training people in such situations will pose special pedagogical challenges to us. Women and girls. The gender gap, despite our knowledge of the benefits of educating women, is appalling. Given the nature of culture, cultural and religious hurdles, ways may have to be found to circumvent these barriers to deliver education to an important half of the human race. Out of work youth, especially boys in some parts of the world, require vocational training to be part of a productive economy. A combination of apprenticeship, employment, and self-education need to be designed to assist them. Failing to do so will be a catalyst for socially disruptive behaviors, social refusal, and criminal activities by an uneducated and disgruntled population. Refugees and recent immigrants and non-nationals Roughly 125 million people today live outside their countries of origin. The flow of the movement of people either for political or economic purposes is not expected to slow down. To better enable the process of settling down, education programs teaching from language, social and job skills have to be designed and delivered. Now providing learning to a diverse group of learners who may or may not have Previous learning experience will need an infrastructure that is flag flexible, global in reach, interactive, and affordable. This learning will also require a curriculum that will enable learners to face the challenges of the 21st century and which will require a number of the following skills. Communication skills, especially in multicultural environments. The mobility of today's population makes it increasingly necessary that we appreciate the cultural differences of people outside our own communities and countries. For peaceful coexistence to happen, there will have to be shared values and insights on political and social issues. People need problem solving skills. This will require in the first place the ability to frame problems, to ask the right questions, and to apply information technologies to solve them. We need skills for working in teams. And finally, we also need self-learning skills to be a lifelong learner, and which would mean identifying for oneself what, ne what needs to be learnt and to go about acquiring this learning. The learning technologies that are being developed will enable individuals to access this learning at a time and pace to suit one's individual needs. This implicitly means that every educated person must spend a portion of his or her time keeping up with the developments in technology. The academic community collectively needs to re-examine not only the way it delivers education, but what the education itself is. The tradition of crammed knowledge must give way to useful knowledge that enables learners to lead a virtuous life. For the first time in history, in the history of the human race, we have an opportunity if we want to reach almost every single community on the planet. 20th century technology has made it possible for educators to reach millions in a single moment. Consider for a moment what has been possible in the last 10 years. In Honduras, for example, the use of a specific oral rehydration solution to treat diarrhea dehydration from zero to 40% of all episodes of diarrhea just one year after a systematic program of public education was launched, within a year. In this country,
condom sales increase from fewer than 25 million in the late 60s to more than 160 million in 1979, and 75% of the increase was accounted for by a new brand introduced through a marketing approach that relied heavily on consumer education. In South Africa, as part of the transformation from the viciousness of apartheid to participatory democracy required educating the people not only what democracy is, but also the real, their role in it. A mass voter education campaign took the population from being passive victims to active citizens in six months. In British Columbia, the Knowledge Network reaches three million individuals in the province alone with university-level courses in sciences, arts, economics, mathematics. A rough estimate indicates that there may be more than 16,000 radio stations and more than one billion radio receivers in operation around the world. The development of the wind-up radio and miniaturization of transmitters can only increase this capacity. Television is now found in every nation on Earth. Cellularization and further development of wireless technology will enable telephonic capabilities to reach individuals even in the remotest corners of the Earth. The Internet, via the electronic highway, has some 30 million subscribers, and it is expected to double every year. Satellite transmission, cable networks, video recording, durable transistors, the Internet, multimedia hardware, and extremely intelligent and friendly software are all opening up opportunities for people even in the poorest parts of the planet to access information and knowledge. There is a revolution taking place out there in programming technology that is showing up, showing the way to expand teaching, training, and educating. Some interesting examples mentioned at the Jomtien conference in 1990 include a rock video motivating young people in Mexico to delay sexual activity, thereby reducing health and psychological risks. A radio-based lottery in Gambia that teaches rural women about a new remedy for diarrhea. A mass campaign in Turkey to increase the catchment for child immunization campaigns. An introduction course to computing via the internet with global outreach. This revolution opens up so many opportunities for us to educate humanity, to intellectually enrich it for greater participation, participation in the affairs of their communities, alter attitudes to lifestyles, change behavior for better health, and retrain and reskill for greater productivity and income. For example, closer to 150 million young people are expected to seek tertiary education in the first quarter of the next century. 150 million. The wherewithal to provide this education through Aristotelian ways is not there. New technologies and methods of delivering tertiary education must provide a solution. There is a solution. Those entering the workforce today may have to be retrained at least five times by the end of their working lives to keep themselves gainfully employed. The planet's workforce at the turn of the century is expected to number some two billion. Taking such individuals out of work for training is a waste of time and is not acceptable both by the individuals and the employers. Self-instruction methods will have to be the answer. The number of youth out of school globally, some 100 million, to bring them to mainstream and a personally satisfying life will need carefully constructed and delivered education. Present classroom methods may not be suitable for one reason or another. Distance learning methods have to be tried. 70 to 80 percent of cancer deaths in the USA can be avoided if the behavior associated with such deaths can be altered via mass education programs. Five to 10 million people are estimated to be infected with the HIV virus associated with AIDS. The only assured cure at the moment is prevention. People learning what the virus is, how it is transmitted, and altering their behavior accordingly. Technology does not teach. It enables the delivery of teaching. It shifts the responsibility of learning 
away from the teacher to the learner, thereby transforming the relationship between teachers and learners. We are entering an era where both multimedia and hypermedia are bringing together under one umbrella the essence of print, audio, video signals, computer-assisted instruction, computer conferencing, and computer-assisted group learning. At the heart of this teaching and learning transaction will be the institutions and the teachers in them. The challenge for the education community will be to create pedagogies of learning that will set the educational parameters within which the technologies will contribute to effective learning. Even before the arrival of the newer technologies, the community of distance educators across the world have been at the forefront of a paradigm shift that has been taking place over the past 30 years, both by design and circumstance. The circumstances dealt mostly with users of distance education who needed increased and flexible access to information, increased and flexible opportunities for interaction between mentors and peers, increased student time on task, more opportunities to control their own learning, learning to be more relevant to their daily lives, greater response to their individual circumstances, regular and sensitive encouragement. By design, in responding to the needs of learners, distance education has been instrumental in making some fundamental changes to long-held beliefs about where, when, and how teaching and learning should take place. What is critical is not where students are located, but whether they can interact with the teacher or teaching programs. Bringing about the desired levels of interaction between students and teachers and programs will, will mean subscribing to a list of good principles. Let me just say seven of them. Effective learning takes place when courses are carefully created. There has to be adequate teacher-learner contact. Active learning is what is needed. Peer support in learning is highly beneficial, so how do you link them? Feedback is needed, and you know it, how important it is. Setting deadlines for tasks or task-oriented deadlines is important, and we need to create pathways to learning, which is sensible, sensitive, easy to follow. Bill Gates, the enormously successful technological entrepreneur in his recent book, The Road Ahead, reflected, and I quote, we are all beginning another great journey. We aren't sure where this one will lead us either. But again, I'm certain this revolution will touch even more lives and take us all even further. It seems to me that how much further we want to go as educators and as agents of change is capped not by technology, not even by resources, but by our own imagination. Relying on present knowledge of instruction and the technologies of print, audio, and video with human intervention at specific times will not be enough for the agenda of the 21st century. We are required to put in place organizations and people who can deliver courses at any location chosen by the learner. We need partnerships and associations which will work in a linked network of providers, thereby providing unlimited choice to the learner. We need new strategies for course development and certification. And we need arrangements that will link students among themselves, link students to tutors and tutors to tutors. We need a fresh look at our curriculum. And we need a curriculum that is dynamic. Not one which confines learners to fixed points, but one that is seamless and open. I'm told the technology to do all of this is there. What is needed is a vision to make it happen. And as the seer said, where there is no vision, people will perish. Mr. Chairman, friends and colleagues, let me conclude this lecture to a dear friend by quoting one hero, Arthur C. Clarke of mine. Men need the mystery and romance of new horizons almost as badly as they need food and shelter. In the difficult years ahead, we should remember that the snows of Olympus lie silent beneath the stars waiting for our grandchildren. My other hero, Ram Reddy, 
the person whose memory we are observing this evening would agree to this most enthusiastically. Thank you. Professor Takwale will now present a memento to Professor Dhanarajan on behalf of IGNU. Rajan's presence on this historic occasion. We now open up the session to questions and comments from the audience. First, I would request Professor Sam Shamsher Ali, Vice Chancellor of the Bangladesh Open University, to please respond to the presentation. I would like to record on my own behalf and on behalf of all the educationists of Bangladesh very glowing tributes to the memory of late Professor G. Ram Reddy. Professor Ram Reddy's connections with the Bangladesh Open University has been very intimate. I remember one occasion when one gentleman, while complimenting him on distance education performances, said, Sir, you have been vice chancellor of three universities. You have fathered two distance universities, namely the Andhra Pradesh Open University, which was later renamed as B.R. Ambedkar Open University and the Indira Gandhi Open University. Hardly had he progressed. Professor Amredi said, No, you are wrong. I fathered two open universities, but I also conceived another open university. And he pointed to me, and he said he delivered it. And we could deliver that open university without much of a pen because of the great care with which he prepared the feasibility study of the open university. Nobody would be more happier on this planet now, then Professor Amredi to know that the university which he conceived has been progressing very fast, and only within three and a half years of its existence, the enrollment has risen to more than 90,000. I met Professor Amredi here in Delhi. I met him at Vancouver. I met him at Birmingham and where Professor Dhanarajan and Professor Thakul were all present, it was only hours, not days before his death, that we met him at a party at the Marlborough House in London, where there was a reception in honor of the outgoing president, uh, Sir James Maraj. And again, we exchanged notes, and we thought of having him over to Bangladesh on the occasion of the first convocation, yes. but that was not to be. Today, we are while we listened intently to the memorial yes, lecture fine. by Professor Dhanurajan, I was thinking how best to commemorate the memory of Professor Ram Reddy. I think it is about time that we address ourselves to the needs of non-formal education through the system of distance education. So far, it was formal education which received attention. But if we want to bring about linkages between distance education and the developmental efforts of third world countries, as pointed out in the memorial lecture, we have to take the open university to the large masses in the, the, to the poor and the underprivileged populations in the third world countries. And I conclude by saying that I personally feel that the best way to pay tribute to Ram Reddy would be to work very hard and make distance education a way of the 21st century. Let us all work towards that goal. Uh, excuse me for interrupting, Professor Shamshir Ali. I think there is an outside call. We'll be taking an outside call right now. Uh, <coughs> While we are waiting for the call, I would also like to announce that outstation people may call us up 
for the reactions and comments on the following numbers 6868360 you may also fax your questions or comments on the following number 6868299 I now request further questions from the floor. Professor S. K. Varma, former Vice Chancellor, CIEFL. I'll be very brief. I found your talk very stimulating and interesting. Somehow I get the impression that our focus is moving from distance as a mode, as a methodology as a technique, to a philosophy of education, to a new approach to the processes underlying the notion of learning. Would you agree with this? Uh, when the... Excuse me for interrupting. There is a call from out front. I'm okay. Yes, please come in. Madras on the line. Yes, please come in, Madras. Please come in, Madras. We are waiting for your call. Madras, please come in. You're waiting for a question, Madras. Hello. Yes, please come in. Uh, this is uh, Srinivasan from Madras. Yes. Uh, Professor Dharajan, thank you for your entertaining lecture. Your uh, talk about openness and learning is more pertinent was well appreciated by everyone here. Uh, I think uh, we should uh, slightly remove the barrier between the teacher and the taught. I think the teacher and the taught should, uh, should learn from each other. If that, I think, is Professor Ramaradi's dream. Thank you. Over. Professor Dhanarajan may like to respond yes. to the former question as well as this one. Well, it's easy to perhaps respond to the, the, the second one. Uh, th that is, is, a, is, a, is a new culture. The, there isn't going to be a barrier between those who teach and those who learn if we as educators have done a... Uh, Excuse uh, me, I'm really sorry. I think it will be better if you just... There is another call and I cannot interrupt that. <laughs> okay. No. I, we are paying the price of technology. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I like half answers. <laughs> yes, please come in. We are waiting for a call. Please come in. Hello. Yes, please come I'm in. I'm speaking from Hyderabad Regional Center. Uh, I would really like to thank Professor Dharajan. His speech was really enlightening to all of us here. And some of the Professor Ram Reddy's family members are present here. And uh, in fact, it was really good. Thank you. W would you want to? Would you want me to respond to the second question? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for the last remark. Uh, the response to the second question: We're talking about uh, helping each other to navigate through knowledge, and that's really what oh. technology is going to enable us all to do. The, the way knowledge itself is growing, it's not going to be possible for any one person to be the guru, and the rest of humanity be, to be the learners. If, if educational systems have done their job well, we are looking at mature learners coming into learning over and over again. What they would need is a pilot who pilots, just like a pilot uh, out in a harbor, uh, enabling a ship's captain to maneuver into the harbor itself. Those who of us who have the privilege of, privilege of being teachers are going to be those pilots to navigate learners through this field of knowledge. And I I, 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 in, in, in a sense, the way technology has, has, has developed, especially the software technology, this is currently uh, what is happening in many institutions, not institutions that deliver uh, their, their knowledge at a distance or for a distance learner, but institutions that are actually delivering knowledge at close proximity. Uh, I'm sure I see a number of heads that are shaking, including my colleague Abdul Khan, and he may want to comment on this. He's, he has a greater sense and knowledge of what technology and its capacity is than I am. I, I make the political speeches, and he does uh, the, the real things in life. <laughs> Thank you. I 
I think Professor R. V. Chandrasekhar Rao from the Commonwealth of Learning had a question to ask. Let me join all of you in uh, paying tributes to Professor Ramridi and in rededicating ourselves to the cause for which he stood. I think in this gathering or any other gathering, I will be the person that have known him for the longest period of time, almost exactly 40 years. And if I may say so, I knew him long before Mrs. Reddy knew him. <laughs> Hence, my loss and sense of loss and grieving. grief is much more to that extent. It is a fitting thing that both the Commonwealth of Learning and IGNO should do this honor to him. And by that, we are honoring distance education. I propose your lecture, Raj. How can we be very confident that in the field of education technology, the gap between the developing and the developed world would not be the same as the chasm in the industrial phase of the civilization? Or is there anything like the concept of appropriate technology in the area of education technology also? I would like your comments on this. I, I, I'm not sure that we can be confident, Prof, that this particular chasm that you refer to will disappear. But uh, perhaps the, the optimism is based on the fact that unlike the industrial uh, age, uh, the revolution that you refer to, the new revolution is enabling uh, technology to be made available to all those who need it without, without cost being an impediment. And I think probably this is where our hopes have to be. As we develop greater sophistication, we're looking at, at lower costs. And, and I refer to the, 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 the wind-up radio as an example. Uh, it would have been almost impossible for a, for a villager in remote Africa or, or India to own one. And even if they own one, to be able to maintain its serviceability, what technology has done is to now overcome that barrier, both in terms of cost and maintenance. Can we look forward to similar things happening? Uh, my optimism is yes. Uh, my optimism is also based on the fact that there is a hunger. There is a hunger for knowledge. There is also uh, greatly thanks to the free flow of information, whether it's radio, television, or whatever. People know what's out there. We, we are no longer uh, uh, communities of mushrooms kept in the dark. We are communities that do know what is happening around us, have a desire to acquire, and I think the will to, 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 to reach out to acquire it. Now, between these two, I would suspect that uh, the gap that you're talking about could be reduced. It may not disappear. I, I look at myself, and I grew up in a plantation uh, in remote rural Malaysia. And, and, and uh, in the last 30, 40 years, the, the change that's taken place within me, uh, if that is possible to a little kid from Malaysia, I can't see why it cannot be possible elsewhere. Before we take up the next question from the floor, I'll just like to announce the numbers once again where the outstation audience can call us up. The numbers are 686-8360, 685-7063, You may also fax your questions and comments on 686-8299. And now Professor S.P. Verma, former professor of the IGNU, has a question. First of all, let me express our sincere gratitude to you for bringing alive the memory of Professor Ram Reddy, whom we all miss. It was he who persuaded me, after a lifelong traditional teaching, to come to distance learning. And I became a convert very soon. I tried to see that this philosophy of distance education is spread as much as possible. I would like to ask you one thing. 
in spite of all that the Commonwealth of Learning has done and the other open universities, why is it when I talk to the students in India even now when I go to various groups, there's still a certain prejudice. I don't know in other countries, but here you say open university and they say correspondence. Excuse course. me, Professor Varma. We'll take another question from okay. the outside. And you could respond to both. Maybe, yes, please come in, Karnal. Hello. Yes, please, Hello. Ca please come in. Hello. Please yes. come. With the contribution of uh, Professor G. Ram Reddy to the profession of uh, distance education, as well as with the introduction of information technology, we have almost reduced the distance between the teacher and the taught. Is it still wise to call it a distance education, Professor Dhanrajan? Sometimes some names stick like mud, and I think uh, this may be one of those unfortunate things. No, there's no need to, to call things distance. We, we are talking about access to education rather than distance as, as, as a phenomenon. And that's what, what, uh, what this, this whole uh, new uh, culture is about, providing access where there wasn't any. Uh, some would have felt that, that the barriers were the campus walls. Others oh, now know that it's more. Could you please wait for some time? Hello, could, Hello? You, could you please wait for some time? Hello? Okay, please give in your question. I'll shut up. Okay. <laughs> yeah, please, Hyderabad, please give in your question. Please send I'm in. I'm speaking from Hyderabad, the regional center. Professor Haragopal, student of Professor Amredi. I work in Hyderabad University. We are looking forward to the visit of Professor Dhanrajan to Hyderabad on 4th. And we are all, you know, quite stimulated by this discussion. But I have a small question to ask. Now, in India, we have a large number of poor people and tribals living beyond uh, the reach of technology. Now, how does the open university system reaches this large, unfortunate millions of rural India, and particularly the tribal India? Uh, before Professor Dhanrajan answers these three questions, I would request the outstation people to please hold on for a while. There is a danger of Professor Dhanrajan forgetting the three <laughs> questions. <laughs> I've already forgotten the first two. Yeah, we, we talked about access to education and, and that being the, the, the new, new culture. So by all means, change distance and throw it away and have something else in its place. But, but don't forget the, the, the basic mission and objective that our, our aspiration is to make education available to all, uh, regardless of barriers of space, time, age, gender, prior uh, educational experience, and whatever. Uh, earlier, Professor Varma referred to a prejudice. Sometimes I think certain things are so deep-seated, and the deep-seated prejudice is not about distance and open learning. It's about providing access to learning. There's a sus our culture has got used to specific goal, achievement of goals at certain parts of our life. You've got to have a primary school certificate before you could enter a junior secondary school, a certificate there to go to senior secondary school and beyond to universities. Those who are able to jump these hurdles are considered to be the appropriate recipients for higher knowledge. Those who can't, sorry, tough luck. I think this is, this is going to take a long, long time to, to break. And it's not just here in India, it's all over the world. But uh, that shouldn't be a cause for us not to try. I think we should continue to try to break those barriers. And it's already, I, I, I'm again uh, an optimist. I see the change happening uh, I, in, in smaller, at least, territories. In, 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 in Hong Kong, for example, where I, which I am often very fond of quoting, uh, when 89, when the Open Learning Institute started, and there they don't have a qualification as a requirement to study for a university degree. There was skepticism, there was prejudice. Uh, eight years later, four sets of graduates later, uh, the prejudice has not been removed. But what is happening is the value of those people who have graduated from the system. They are a preferred employee in many instances than those who are coming fresh out of a, out of a, 
out of a university. But that has not stopped the University of Hong Kong, the grand dam of a Hong Kong higher education system to say, well, that's open education. The graduates cannot be as good as ours. It's their ignorance, and why should we worry about it anyway? Dr. S.K. Gandhi has a question from the floor. Respects and tribute to the great Professor Ram Reddy. And then, sir, I have a question for you. I personally believe that we are blindly copying the technological developments that are taking place in the West. I don't know whether it is the result of aggressive marketing techniques adopted by the producers of this equipment. In poor countries like ours, where millions of people do not have even the wherewithals of <coughs> good living, where we say more than 40% of the people are below the poverty line, and those who understand the concept of poverty line will also realize the intensity of poverty in this country. We do not have roads do not have radios, we do not have TVs. I think for at least two to three decades to come, we cannot do away with the traditional media, the print media in this country. Our efforts at launching the most modern media, the teleconferencing, the computer conferencing, the video text and all others, would only be catering to the elitist sections of the society. And we are widening this divide between the rich and the poor. As it applies to a society in India, it also applies to the nations in the, country, in the world that we are dividing the countries into the information haves and the information have nots and creating a dichotomy, but perpetuating the culture of the dichotomy, how far it is suitable to the third world country, to the densely populated countries, and to the countries where for various reasons, social and historical, the women have been denied the greatest opportunity, and even now, their role is conceived to be within the four walls of a house. How do we go except the print material? And why do we, I am to be very frank, brutally frank, waste our energies on the systems and areas of which we are ourselves not totally convinced? Are we going back to the concept of a classroom, face-to-face -face classroom through technology? Is it convenient for the workers who work for eight hours a day and who have their family responsibilities on Saturdays and Sundays? Where are we leading ourselves to? I cannot disagree with you, Prof. I think I got to agree with you that you cannot blindly follow a technology developed by in another culture to be used in, in yours. But it would be, I think, also naive not to believe, uh, naive Please hold on. to Please hold on while you naive to believe that uh, a technology cannot be tamed for your use. Print itself is a technology that was discovered somewhere out there in the West, I don't know, Please hold on for 200 years, 300 years ago. Thank God we have been able to tame it, and we are using it, and you're comfortable with it. Shouldn't that be the, 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 the indicator for us? Shouldn't we be looking at technology, taming it, making Please it appropriate for, for our use, rather than denying access to the technology? You, you're also right, you cannot take uh, certain technologies to the confines of a, a room where uh, 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 our women are kept. But there are technologies you can take, uh, print being one, television certainly, radio. It is possible. I think it's a question of us trying rather than us denying us the opportunity just because it got discovered or invented somewhere else. There was a question from Madras. Madras, please. Yeah, Madras, please send in your question. Hello. Yes, Madras, please come in. Uh, Madras, I'm talking. Hello. 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 H
Please come up. Are you hearing me? Yes, we are hearing you. Please come up. Ah, Professor Janrajan. Yes, please come up. UKOU is an open university for a very small country. Indira Gandhi National Open University is a open university for such a large country with possibly 140 languages. I think Professor Ramareddy has been to be acknowledged for having accepted and achieved an open learning system for this country. Thank you. Over. Professor Dhanrajan, would you be reacting to this? No, I'm, I'm not reacting. Yeah, there is another question from the floor. I introduce myself as the Vice Chancellor of the Open University of Sri Lanka. I am Professor Arthur uh, It has been a privilege for me to have been with uh, this audience today to listen to Professor Dhanrajan for his stimulating and thought provoking lecture in the memory of uh, Professor Ram Reddy, who, whom I had the occasion to know personally for 11 years. And I have met him uh, on several occasions, and uh, I have had the highest regard <coughs> for him as an educationist for excellence, particularly in the field of distance education. And there are so many people in the Open University of Sri Lanka who <coughs> hold him in high esteem. We were indeed uh, very saddened yes. to hear of his demise, about which I came to know a day later through two of my colleagues who happened to be in Delhi at the time. And they faxed me saying that he had passed away. And it was uh, a shocking piece of news to all of us in Colombo. And we, all we could do was to fax Professor Takwale, sending our condolences at the time. Now, I had the privilege of uh, being present at a meeting last February at the IGNAU. Uh, there was a meeting of vice chancellors of the region, which was attended by yours. Permanent Secretary, I believe, is uh, Mr. Das Gupt, if I remember him. And uh, this was chaired by Professor Amreddy. And at this meeting, I remember he raised, uh, amongst many issues, <coughs> issues, two vital issues. One was about the quality of, how do we maintain quality in distance education? He raised the question as to whether the, this is a, a second chance and of second class. The second issue that he raised was uh, still, uh, uh, it has a special interest in me because we are very concerned about quality, therefore let me talk, not, talk about, not talk about quality. That was about uh, why do we reinvent the wheel? We in the region have developed so many programs which suit uh, the countries of the region without having to redo it once again. Why not we take an initiative to uh, make use of this material? Now, I know that the Commonwealth of Learning has taken an initiative towards this line. I would like Professor Dhanrajan to uh, uh, tell this audience and also, I know, through the technology now we are reaching the entire Indian, uh, entire country. Uh, what initiatives do you, do you envisage taking uh, towards uh, uh, using the material that is already available? Thank you. Well, one of the one of the basic uh, uh, mission uh, aspirations of the Commonwealth of Learning was to enable the easy movement of materials from one Commonwealth country to another. Um, at least that was the theory and uh, perhaps a naive belief in 1987-88 when the organization was 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 conceptualized. Since then, I think uh, there has been quite a lot of change in the world of learning itself, where the, the noble aims of exchanging knowledge at no cost no longer holds true. Knowledge is seen as a product, and it has a value, and those who have it would want to cost it. So material exchange, while continues to be of great interest to the Commonwealth of Learning, we need to skin this particular cat in a slightly different way. We cannot believe that 
these materials can flow because an agency like Call is acting as a broker. What we need to do is to bring all of those who own intellectual property to a forum to discuss uh, in the real world what would be a cost and how this cost could be met. Uh, if there is an exchange of such cost through kind, whether that is a possibility. And it's very likely in regions such as this, amongst universities of India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, you are a lot more generous with each other than, say, uh, in terms of your relationship between uh, this region and, and, and the UK or, or Canada. But even there, I think uh, uh, it, is, it is possible for us to negotiate not the real cost, but a marginal cost. We hope a number of these issues can be discussed at a forum sometimes later in the year, which Professor Rao uh, is helping to organize as well, maybe uh, held in Vancouver, where we could draw protocols uh, specifying the, the, the nature of exchange, the cost of exchange, and how this cost could be, could be met. Uh, that would be a starting point. I'd like to be a little bit more ambitious. I think there is actually an opportunity for us not to worry about materials that's been created and kept in the shelves, because a lot of them may be already be outdated. But in terms of creating new materials, and we are constantly renewing our shelves, in such efforts, could we work collaboratively? And I think it's possible. And could we draw protocols that will enable for such things to happen? And uh, my own sense is the Commonwealth of Learning could act as a catalyst, can provide some seed resources, and could all the wheels to make uh, a joint development of courses a possibility. Uh, I think that's the real hope in terms of material movement. We have many more questions, but I'm sorry we will not be able to take, up, take them up because of uh, the satellite time being over at 6 o'clock. Maybe when Professor Dhanarajan visits the various regions, he would have time for more fruitful, closer interaction with people. I would now call upon Professor Rakesh Kurana, Pro Vice Chancellor Ignu, and the Chairman of the Professor Amredi Memorial Committee to please give the vote of thanks. It's uh, really my proud privilege to thank, uh, first of all, Mrs. Uh, Pramila Reddy for being with us on this occasion. Many a times, Professor Reddy, in somewhat informal conversation, would say, my dear, it's just said that behind a great man there is a great woman. And he used to say, behind this man, there is really a great woman. We really appreciate her being here on this first anniversary of Professor Amredi and other family members in Hyderabad. We are thankful to Professor Dhanrajan for accepting the invitation for the first memorial lecture. I have to share this with everybody that when the proposal of the committee, the Professor G. Ram Reddy Memorial Committee was put before the board of IGNU, at that time board specifically said that we would like to have a person who has contributed through open and distance education to the development of this part of the world, developing countries. And Professor Dhanrajan's name came up. It was only subsequently after he had kindly agreed to be here on 2nd July, though he has commitments immediately after this and commitments before that, that actually the proposal was put to the Commonwealth of Learning's board whether they would also fund the lecture. In other words, the choice of the board of IGNU to invite Professor Dhanrajan for this first memorial lecture preceded the decision of the Commonwealth of Learning Board to fund this lecture for the first three years, for which we are thankful to the Board of Commonwealth of Learning. 
Professor Dhanarajan has given this excellent word scenario and the role of open learning in that or by whatever name that type of learning goes. And also, we are happy that we have been able to get this lecture across, not to just a limited audience in Delhi, but to all our regional centers, and for the first time, sir, to all the state open universities, which is really a sense of, um, well, achievement from the lead which was given by Professor Ram Reddy, that we should work in a networked way. We hope, with the presence of the um, vice chancellors from some of the other South Asian countries, uh, today we have uh, from uh, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, that perhaps the next lecture would be where all the other open universities of the South Asia would also be part of this lecture. In this context, therefore, I would like to thank Indian Space Research Organization, its DECU unit, the Delhi Earth Station, for providing this facility, which in a sense again traces its origin to Professor Ram Reddy's initiative, Professor Kulanda Swami's initiative, and the Prime Minister, Mr. Narasimha Rao, dedicating this TDCC channel, as it is called, and the IGNU network of it in February of 95, so that the interactive learning can progress further. We are thankful to the 16 regional centers which have made arrangements for receiving this lecture. Some only had the time to participate, and three state open universities. I would like to recognize Dr. Swaminathan, the member of uh, Planning Commission, the former VC of uh, JNTU in Hyderabad, who has been giving us great support and ideas in terms of how we might go towards an open learning net throughout the country. We are thankful to you, Dr. Swaminathan, for being here on this occasion. Mr. Giri, we couldn't thank you more. Well, currently he is CVC, but we are really referring to his period as the Secretary of the MHRD. The relationship which the university has had with the ministry, or the ministry has had with the university, with Professor Ram Reddy, with the other colleagues, his contribution to the board, really gives us encouragement. Sir, your presence here on this first Professor G. Ram Reddy Memorial Lecture with whom you had great association uh, would help us to take some of the ideas further which you and he conceived together. I'm thankful to uh, my colleagues on the Professor G. Ram Reddy Memorial Committee, Dr. Prasad, Director Deck, who's the chair of the program committee, which has identified five areas. The first has happened today. Mr. Ram Takwale mentioned the National Fellowship Scheme in Distance Education, which we would like to launch, the best research work, which we would like to acknowledge, an award for best suggestion or innovation for improving the open learning system, named after Professor Ram Reddy. Some of these schemes, now we have the courage to take further. Professor Boite, the chairperson of the YCMOU, uh, Professor Atanayake, the Vice Chancellor of uh, Sri Lanka Open University, Mr. Shamsher Ali, Vice Chancellor of Bangladesh Open University, Dr. Manan, Chairman of National Open School, Mr. Verma, former, Chairman, former Vice Chancellor of CIFL, Mr. Chandrasekhar Rao, former BRAU VC, Mr. Sharma, Kota Open University Vice Chancellor, Dr. Khan, a former colleague, now in CUL, Mr. Shamshad Hussain, Nalanda Open University VC, Mr. Mathur, VC of the UGC, and all our friends and colleagues who have helped this occasion, who have helped this lecture to take place in a manner it has gone. Once again, thank you, Professor, Ram, uh, uh, Professor Raj Dhanarajan. We hope we would have your continuing association with the activities associated in the memory of Professor.